Hello everyone, Dr. Polaris here. During the late Cretaceous, North America was a continent divided, split in two by the Great Western Interior Seaway. Forming roughly a hundred million years ago, this body of water bisected the landmass on a north-south axis, spanning from the high Arctic to the Gulf of Mexico, covering the region that would later become the Great Plains of Canada and the United States. At its largest, the Western Interior Seaway stretched from the Rockies east to the Appalachian Mountains, some 1,000 kilometers or 620 miles wide. At its deepest, it may have been only 800 to 900 meters or 2,600 to 3,000 feet deep, which is comparatively shallow, with its waters being warm and teeming with life. These conditions led to the formation of two distinct land masses, with the relatively slim Laramidia in the west and the larger Appalachia in the east. While Laramidia produced a great many rich fossil bearing deposits, such as the Dinosaur Park, Lance and Hell Creek formations, containing the remains of some of the most famous and iconic prehistoric species, such as Tyrannosaurus, Triceratops and Ankylosaurus, Appalachia's fossil fauna is far more poorly understood. This is somewhat ironic, considering that the very first North American dinosaurs to be scientifically described, Hadrosaurus and Dryptosaurus, were native to Lake Cretaceous Appalachia. However, as I noted in my Paleoart series, these animals were quickly overshadowed by their larger, more complete and more abundant Laramidian contemporaries. In addition, while former Appalachia does possess many notable fossil-bearing rock formations, the remains of the animals in question are often highly fragmentary, which reminds me of the Mesozoic dinosaur fossils that we have here in the UK. So, I bet you're wondering, what's the reason behind this extreme disparity? Well, due to high sea levels, subsequent erosion due to the glaciation cycles of the Pleistocene, and the lack of the mountain building that was occurring in eastern Laramidia, which produced significant amounts of sedimentary deposits that ran off into the seaway, Appalachia lacked comparable terrestrially formed deposits. Indeed, the vast majority of known dinosaur species from this region represent the remains of carcasses that were swept out to sea. This same lack of terrestrial deposits is also present on the western coast of Laramidia, explaining why states like California and Oregon are not exactly renowned for their late Cretaceous dinosaur fossils. In addition, due to a lack of interest in Appalachia, many fossils that were found in the eastern United States during the period of the Bone Wars have sat undescribed for many decades in museum collections. It's also probably not a coincidence that a significant part of former Appalachia includes the poorest US states, especially in the south, meaning that paleontological efforts there face an uphill struggle. However, the area has thankfully seen a bit of a resurgence of interest due to several new discoveries made in the 2010s and 2020s, which have highlighted Appalachia's unique Cretaceous dinosaur faunas, which were notably distinct from those of Laramidia. Although, at the time in which the interior seaway was beginning to form circa 100 million years ago, the inhabitants of Appalachia were seemingly pretty similar to those found out west. Unsurprisingly, all of these are known from very scrappy and partial remains, with some very famous genera being found here, with teeth assigned to both Acrocanthosaurus and Deilonychus being found in Maryland. The former was a large, formidable carcharodontosaur that appears to have been very widespread across the US during the Aptian and Albion stages of the Cretaceous, between 113 and 110 million years ago. Measuring 11.5 meters or 37.7 feet long at a maximum, and weighing at least 4.4 metric tons, this apex predator possessed a long, low and narrow skull, equipped with relatively small yet very sharp serrated teeth. One of its most notable traits was a row of tall neural spines, located on the vertebrae of the neck, back, hips and upper tail, which could be more than 2.5 times the height of the vertebrae from which they extended. The function of these spines remains unknown, although they may have been involved in communication, fat storage, muscle or temperature control. Like other very large theropods, Acrocanthosaurus was almost certainly not a fast-running animal, being an ambush-hunting efficient power walker instead, targeting slow-moving sauropods, ornithopods, and possibly ankylosaurs. Although far better represented from Oklahoma, Texas, and Wyoming, the Appalachian remains of this genus were thought to consist only of isolated teeth. This was until 2024, 
when an incomplete theropod skeleton known as USNM 466054 from the Arundel Formation of Maryland was identified as that of a subadult Acrocanthosaurus, marking the first definitive record of the genus from eastern North America. This skeleton, the most completely known theropod from the formation despite its fragmentary nature, had been previously thought to be an ornithomimosaur, and also represents the smallest known individual of the genus. It lived alongside and almost certainly preyed upon juveniles of the 20 meter long sauropod Astrodon, the armoured nodosaurid Priconodon, and an animal that may have been the ornithischian Tenontosaurus. Indeterminate dromaeosaur teeth, recovered from the Arundel formation, indicate the presence of the famous dromaeosaur Deinonychus, which was a contemporary of Acrocanthosaurus and Tenontosaurus in the western United States as well. Other earlier Cretaceous dinosaurs that were rough contemporaries of the continental division include the relatively large basal ornithomimosaur Archonsaurus, which was unsurprisingly native to Arkansas during the Albion to Aptian stages. This slender herbivore, while known from partial remains, is thought to have measured about 4.6 metres or 15 feet long, and was probably a fleet-footed omnivore or herbivore. Other Appalachian ornithomimosaurs are known from the Upper Cretaceous Utah formation of Alabama, one of which may have been a relative of Dinochirus, although these have not yet received official names. Nodosaurs also seem to have been common in the region during the early Cretaceous, with Sylvisaurus and Pawpawsaurus having been uncovered from Kansas and Texas respectively. After a hundred million years ago, Appalachia and its animals became isolated from those in western North America. This led to a distinctive late Cretaceous faunal group that was notably different from that present in Laramidia, which was dominated by huge tyrannosaurids, ceratopsids, derived hadrosaurs, pachycephalosaurs and ankylosaurids. While the apex predatory theropods of Appalachia were still tyrannosauroids, these were modestly sized and relatively basal when compared to their Laramidian cousins. Only two genera are known from decent enough material to have received official names, with the older of the pair being Appalachiosaurus from the Campanian Age Demopolis Chalk Formation of Alabama, dating to between 82 and 77.9 million years ago. The only known specimen of this genus was a juvenile individual, which consisted of parts of the skull and lower jaw, as well as several vertebrae, parts of the pelvis and most of the back legs. It measured roughly 6.5 meters or 21 feet long and weighed about 623 kilograms or 1,378 pounds. Appalachiosaurus was a derived Tyrannosauroid, with most studies placing it as a close relative of the family Tyrannosauridae. The jaws would have been relatively powerful and were able to exert an estimated bite force of 32,500 newtons or 7,193 pounds per square inch. Although no other dinosaurs have been found from the Demopolis Chalk Formation, it's reasonable to assume that this animal preyed on hadrosauroids, nodosaurids, and possibly ornithomimosaurs. The other and more famous Appalachian tyrannosaur was the genus Dryptosaurus, from the late Maastrichtian of New Jersey. Along with hadrosaurus, this theropod was among the first non-avian dinosaurs from North America to be scientifically described with the holotype being given the name Laylapse by Edward Drinker Cope in 1866, and was then re-described as Dryptosaurus by Othniel Marsh in 1877. This predator, known from a single partial specimen, is estimated to have been 7.5 meters or 25 feet long, and 756 to 1,500 kilograms in weight. Possessing somewhat narrow jaws, blade-like teeth, and comparatively elongated forelimbs tipped with two-fingered hands, Tryptosaurus was probably a fairly agile ambush predator that still used its arms as well as its jaws in prey capture. It was native to the New Egypt Formation, which represented a subtropical forested coastal region and preserved the remains of a diverse array of marine species, including sharks, rays, turtles, and mosasaurs. Dinosaur remains here are, once again, pretty rare, with a small partial unnamed hadrosaurid and a potential lambiosaurine being the main prey items for Dryptosaurus. The most well-known of all Appalachian hadrosaurs was Hadrosaurus itself, though, which was also from New Jersey, but lived during the Campanian circa 83 to 77 million years ago. This was the first non-avian dinosaur from North America to be scientifically described, receiving its genus name all the way back in 1858, making it the American equivalent of Iguanodon from the UK in this respect. A relatively large and heavily built herbivore, 
Hadrosaurus is known from a single specimen, recovered from the Woodbury Formation, and could potentially have reached 8 metres or 26 feet long, and weighed up to 4 metric tonnes. Being about the size of an Asian elephant, the genus has been found to be a racial member of the family Hadrosauridae, outside of the major Saurolophine and Lambiosaurine subfamilies. Given that it lived in a humid forested environment, Hadrosaurus was likely a browser, feeding on ferns, angiosperms and conifers. It was somewhat closely related to Eotrachodon, a slightly older genus found in Santonian age deposits in Alabama. Other Appalachian hadrosaurs were more basal, with the prevalence of such animals here once being thought to show the so-called primitiveness of the region's dinosaurs. However, late Cretaceous basal hadrosauromorphs have now been identified from across the northern hemisphere, so this situation is no longer thought to be so unusual. Examples of such forms include the small 3.7 meter or 12 foot long Cleosaurus, which lived between 87 and 82 million years ago, and seems to have been a basal hadrosauromorph, as well as Lophorothon, which was found in the same Alabamian fossil deposits as Eotrachodon, but was at least 3 million years younger. Perhaps the most impressive of all Appalachian hadrosaurs was the massive genus Hypsibema, the type species of which, H. crassi calder, was native to what is now New Jersey and North Carolina during the Campanian. This was a very large hadrosaur with an unusually heavily built tail, with overall size estimates for the animal being pretty speculative given its fragmentary remains. Although it may have been anywhere from 10 to 17 meters long, the upper estimate was based on a very large partial humerus described from North Carolina, which indicates an individual comparable in size to Shantungosaurus, the most massive hadrosaur so far known. A second species, H. missouriensis, was, unsurprisingly, native to what is now Missouri, and is represented by more complete material than H. crassicalda. This species probably measured about 10 meters long, perhaps being a bit smaller than its New Jersey cousin, although both were among the largest of all hadrosaurs, and were truly massive boys. Oh, look at that. It's like an ad for a fucking weight loss center. Before, and way before. This guy ever stopped breaking balls. Meanwhile, the armoured nodosaurids seem to have been relatively common and diverse in late Cretaceous Appalachia, especially when compared to Laramidia, although most of their remains are in the form of isolated osteoderms. A major exception was the genus Neobrarosaurus, the holotype of which is relatively complete due to the fact that its carcass was swept out to sea and buried, much like the aforementioned Cleosaurus. Measuring between 5 to 6 metres or up to 20 feet long, it was a close relative of the Laramidian Nodosaurus, indicating that a degree of faunal interchange occurred during the Coniacian stage of the late Cretaceous. Other dinosaur groups are present in Appalachia, but are known only from isolated teeth or small fragments of bone. Identifiable dromaeosaurid teeth, which are similar to those of the genus Sauronitholestes, have been uncovered across what was then southern Appalachia, but what are now the states of Missouri, North Carolina, South Carolina, Alabama, Mississippi, and Georgia. Larger dromaeosaurid teeth have been found in the Campanian Tar Heel Formation in North Carolina. Additionally, fragmentary fossils from the Cenomanian aged Woodbine group of Texas, dating to between 95 and 100 million years ago, have revealed the presence of large carcharodontosaurids, troodontids, and other small indeterminate salurosaurs. Small ornithischians were also present here as well, in the form of the early Cretaceous Convolosaurus and the probable late Cretaceous Rhabdodont and Pelonathus, both from Texas. In 2016, the partial remains of a leptoceratopsid jaw were found in the Campanian Age Tar Heel Formation of South Carolina. This specimen bears a uniquely long, slender and down-curved upper jaw, suggesting that it was an animal with a specialised feeding strategy, being yet another example of speciation on an island environment. This currently unnamed animal would have been the size of a large dog and was a low-browsing herbivore. Interestingly, while it had once been thought that derived ceratopsids were completely absent from Appalachia, this changed in 2016, when the large ceratopsian tooth was, was unearthed in Mississippi's Owl Creek Formation, which has been dated to 67 million years ago. Probably being a chasmosaurine, closely related to Triceratops, this fossil find demonstrates the partial retreat of the interior seaway during the Maastrichtian, allowing Laramidian dinosaurs to enter Appalachia once again. Who knows, 
perhaps remains of a big Tyrannosaurid, related to or representing Tyrannosaurus, will eventually turn up in the American South as well. The region was also home to a variety of seabird-like avialans, such as the flightless diving Hesperornithes, the soaring ocean-going Enantionothene Halimornis, and a variety of poorly understood shorebird-like ornithurans. The remains of possible late Cretaceous Lithornithid paleonaths have also apparently been found in New Jersey, which, if true, would prove that these modern birds definitively originated during the Mesozoic. After all, these animals must have existed at this time anyway, due to the presence of the Maastrichtian gallo serine bird Asterionis in Belgium. Pterosaur fossils have also been found in Appalachia, with indeterminate pteranodontids and nyctosaurids seemingly being the most common members of the group in the region, although Asdarkid remains have also been recovered from North Carolina as well. Meanwhile, the most abundant Appalachian mammals were the multituberculates, which came in a wide range of different sizes and niches. Metatherians are also known, including an Alphodontid, a Stagodontid, and a Herpetotherid, while Eutherians were present as well, albeit in smaller numbers. Pseudosuchians are also relatively abundant, with a whole host of different species native to Cretaceous Appalachia, including the enormous genus Dinosuchus. Of note here is that eastern populations of this over 10 meter or 34 foot long predator were smaller yet far more numerous than their Laramidian counterparts, perhaps even being the most common Appalachian apex predator. By the time of the KPG extinction event, the region's distinctive fauna had likely received a significant amount of admixture from Laramidia, although it's unclear to what extent until more fossil evidence is uncovered. Regardless, the Chichilub bolide impact would bring an end to Mesozoic Appalachia anyway, with the interior seaway finally disappearing during the Paleocene, leaving the singular North American landmass more familiar to us today. Thanks for watching everyone. The next episode will be a Halloween special, focusing on the Michigan Dogman, as well as other similar werewolf-like North American cryptids. See you again soon. Cheerio.